uh, already uh, and remember to vote. Tonight, uh, we'll feature district attorney candidate uh, Spencer Todd for Marion County uh, and district attorney candidate Brian Decker for Washington County. I also want to make clear that tonight's candidates are not running against each other. Uh, they are each running for separate positions. Uh, they are here to highlight their campaign proposals uh, and answer community questions as potential future state uh, uh, representatives. Invitations were, were extended to uh, other candidates uh, and some uh, either had a scheduling conflict or declined. Although we hope tonight's forum it will be an exciting and uh, formative event. We also want it to be an orderly one. Uh, so uh, here are a few ground rules for the candidates. Uh, first off, please remain uh, muted if you're not uh, answering a question. Uh, this is important for audio issues as well as uh, video focus. Uh, please do not forget this. Uh, second one, uh, each candidate will have two minutes for their opening statement. Uh, we will ask you to deliver your uh, opening statements uh, in reverse alphabetical order. Um, so Spencer Todd first and then Brian Decker second. Uh, when the questions are, uh, sorry, third one, when the questions are asked, each candidate will have four minutes to respond with no rebuttals. Uh, there will be seven questions, however. Uh, we will, uh, we may have an eighth question uh, if time allows. Uh, we will begin uh, in alphabetical order with Brian Decker first and Spencer Todd second. Uh, the fourth, uh, after questions are complete, each candidate will have two minutes uh, to deliver a closing statement. Uh, we ask uh, you to deliver uh, your opening statements in reverse order, in reverse alphabetical order, um, and so we'll be uh, doing the same uh, there. And then uh, fifth, uh, please uh, be courteous and uh, conscientious, conscientious of time uh, and your fellow candidates uh, throughout the forum. Uh, when speaking, if uh, you are within 30 seconds, if you're a lot of time, um, our staff will send you a notification. Um, so, uh, you know, those are the ground rules uh, and would love to usher us into uh, the um, opening statements. Um, and so we'll be, uh, we'll be opening with uh, uh, Mr. Decker um, and then we'll go to uh, Spencer Todd. So. Uh, Mr. Decker, if you would like to uh, begin your two minutes, uh, you have four. I'm I'm happy to. I thought we just said that Spencer was going to go first. Oh, uh, Mr. Todd actually, was going to go first. But... Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Well, hey, whoever would like. I, I I'll do it. We'll we'll keep the we'll keep the order going here. So, um, I'm Spencer Todd. I'm running for Marion County District Attorney. I've been a public defender for the last um, eight years. Uh, there's just, there are a lot of difficult issues in our world today. Homelessness, mental health, and addiction are complex. They're difficult. They require innovative solutions. They're things that are on everybody's mind right now. Um, policing and sentencing disproportionately impact communities of color and those living in poverty. Victims and survivors don't get the support that they need. Many don't even feel safe to report crimes at all. Prosecution and incarceration cannot and will not fix these issues. Our system is outdated, it's costly, and quite frankly, it's unable to meet the public safety needs that we all have today. So we've got a lot of work to do. But I do really believe that working together, we can make things better. I reject the thought that, that somehow this is all lost and all for naught. I mean, there are people that care and people that are putting in the time and want to make things good, want to make things better than they were before. The old approach focused on punishment is flawed. It's expensive. We should be focusing on correction, rehabilitation, and justice, especially for victims. We need to address the root causes of crime, not just the unfortunate aftermath. Our district attorneys should be actively engaged in improving drug treatment options and in expanding mental health services. We also need to provide victims with more information, more input, and more support. We need to ask the question of what can fix your trauma instead of just telling them what's going to happen. 
if we do all these things, we can craft lasting solutions that will reduce cost and focus on restoration, compassion, and justice. I'm Spencer Todd and I'm running for district attorney because I believe we can craft these solutions together. We need to craft these solutions together and we need to do so as a community. When we do that, we will provide support for those among us that are struggling. We will reduce crime and we will make our community safer for everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Decker. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Brian Decker and I am running for uh, district attorney in Washington County. I live in Beaverton. I'm a father of a student in the Beaverton School District. And I was a federal prosecutor during the Obama administration. And I have also been a public defender uh, here in Washington County for about uh, four and a half years. I'm running for district attorney because I believe we need a change. Uh, in my community, gun crime is up. Community trust in law enforcement is down. We're not doing enough to address problems like homelessness and addiction and mental illness, and victims aren't getting the support that they need. I have worked as a lawyer on all sides of the criminal justice system, and that's why I am able to see the way that it works <clears throat> and the fixes that it needs from many perspectives. I volunteered to represent domestic violence victims seeking restraining orders. I volunteered to represent detainees at Guantanamo Bay. As a public defender, I helped poor adults and children accused of crimes get access to justice, navigate the court system, and protect their constitutional rights. As a federal prosecutor, I took on crimes like human trafficking, gun trafficking, and destroying natural resources. I learned that prosecutors wield immense power that can help or harm safety and justice in the community. Here's some of the things I stand for. Prioritizing prevention, addiction, mental illness, poverty, these are primary drivers of crime. And smart public safety policy means preventing crimes before they occur and rehabilitating nonviolent offenders away from criminal behavior. Serving victims, those who have been harmed by crime deserve a voice in our justice system. Equal justice for all. I will enforce the highest ethical standards in our office and address racial discrimination to ensure everyone is treated fairly and real public safety and accountability. No one should get special treatment and no one is above the law. I will be a collaborative leader because I know that I can't make this change happen alone. I will engage with the community and I will listen to advice on how to get things done. I believe that together we can build a system that works for everyone, that moves our community forward. All right, thank you. Uh, now we will begin uh, the question portion of the forum. Uh, for the first question, uh, we will start with uh, you, Mr. Decker, uh, who's running for, again, uh, Washington County uh, District Attorney, and then we'll go to Mr. Todd, uh, the, who will be running for uh, Marion County District Attorney. Uh, so for the first question, um, in January, uh, the American Bar Association released a shocking study, uh, the, uh, the, or the Oregon Project, uh, which found uh, that Oregon has uh, only one third of the public defense attorneys uh, needed to serve uh, its current caseload. Uh, at the time uh, of the report, there were uh, only 592 full-time attorneys contracted by Oregon's public defense system, with the agency operating at a 70% 70, uh, 70 deficit. Uh, this is uh, demonstrative uh, uh, that it uh, that it is failing uh, to meet its constitutional requirements. Uh, couple this with uh, the rates of incarceration for Black Oregonians at 10%, uh, even though we uh, constitute less than 4% of uh, uh, of the population. Addressing this deficit becomes vital uh, to our communities. Uh, what solutions would you recommend for or uh, from for Oregon uh, to meet its Sixth Amendment constitutional op uh, obligations? Thank you. This is this is such an important question, um, and it's it, it's highlighting a, a really 
um, complicated and significant issue in Oregon's criminal justice system. We do not, we are desperately short of the number of public defenders that we need to represent um, people who are being charged with, with crimes. And that is essential to having the system work well. You know, think of, think of the person that you know, who the, you know, family member, loved one, who has gotten in trouble with the law. And, you know, you would want them to have a, a good lawyer, no matter what, you know, no matter what they did or didn't do, if they're accused, you would want them to have a good lawyer to represent them in court. And that means having a lawyer with adequate resources in time and, and um, access to the things that they need to make sure that the case is done right. We have known for years that Oregon is coming up short here in, in adequately funding public defense. Uh, you know, the American Bar Association report, as you said, just came out a few months ago highlighting this, but we've had reports for years showing us that this is a problem. And for years, the state has kicked the can down the road um, in addressing that, that shortage of funding for public defense. A district attorney doesn't get to be the person who sets funding for public defense, doesn't get to be the person who is going to um, make, be able to solve that problem alone. But being a district attorney is or ought to be essentially a collaborative position. And part of that collaboration means working with others and advocating on, on their behalf to make sure that we have a well-functioning criminal justice system. What we need to keep in mind, the key, the two key principles that, that we seek as, uh, as prosecutors are safety and justice. And those two things can only be effectuated if we have a criminal justice system that is functioning properly. So working with community partners, working with community-based organizations, working with other government officials, and, and working with the legislature, we need to bring together these other actors, these other levers of the criminal justice system to make sure that the job is done well. Now, what I've heard my opponent, Kevin Barton, he's the, he's the current elected district attorney in, in Washington County, say about this is, number one, that the problem is public defenders just not showing up, which is completely wrongheaded. And, and for a, for a district attorney to say that means he's already not working collaboratively. He already sees these people as his adversaries even outside of the courtroom. Um, then I've also heard him say that this report from the American Bar Association saying that we only have a third of the numbers that we need is fantastical. And then in the very next breath, uh, granting that he doesn't know very much about this aspect of public safety. Um, I think that that much is clear, uh, that, that his lack of, of understanding of the need here doesn't mean that the need is not real. Um, but it also means that what we need is a district attorney who is going to be a collaborative partner in making it successful. We also need to be looking at the, at, at the other side of what is causing the system to be so clogged. And part of that is the choices that district attorneys are making and exercising their prosecutorial discretion. We need to be making sure that we're moving cases through the system efficiently and prioritizing rehabilitation and prevention so that we don't have people coming through the system again and again and again. Thank you, Mr. Decker. Uh, Mr. Todd. Thanks. Well, Brian did a good job of summarizing the uh, kind of the issues that that exist and what's going on. I'll give a little bit extra context to what the what the Sixth Amendment study really says. The, the reason why we're short lawyers um, is because, you know, when it says we only have one third of the public defenders we need, that's because they are required to do so much work on each individual case. And so we need more lawyers because otherwise the public defenders are stretched so thin that they are not 
doing an adequate job of representing or or they are doing an adequate job of representing but it's causing them the stress that we see that causes people to quit or causes people to you know want to get out of the field and and it and it turns into a really rough job when it's all day every day the same thing and you don't have enough resources and you can't take a break and all of that so so the 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 real thrust of the 6th amendment study is you know we need more public defenders because the cases are the same, but each individual PD should be doing less work and spending more time on each individual case. And so when there are objections about are the PDs showing up or not, it's that they're showing up all the time to too many different things. That's the problem. Um, as far as solves to it, um, you know, Brian already touched on this, but funding is a big one. Obviously, the, the money needs to be there. But the bigger problem is that even if the money's there, uh, being at one third capacity, you're not just going to find a thousand lawyers um, that are willing to do this and that are willing to do this across the state in various counties and in various contexts. And so, you know, it's it's really a thing that requires buy in from a lot of different entities because it's not a fix that we can get done in. You know, there's no there's no single thing that can be done to solve the problem An an infinite amount of money wouldn't fix the issue. Um, but if if we do have better funding and do kind of make it a better quality of life on the public defense facing side, then there are things that can be done from the prosecution side um, that are, you know, kind of, I don't want to call them efficiencies, but basically doing the right thing in your discretion. And for the cases that can be resolved early, have them resolved early. And for the cases that need to have more time spent on them, spend more time on them. But if you do that, over a long period of time with solid work and solid prosecutions with well-trained staff in a well-run office that will help alleviate the issue so that maybe you know we don't need a thousand public defenders maybe we only need 900 public defenders but but ultimately um you know the, the good news is there are a lot of people that realize this is an issue there's an email that goes out every week to i'm sure brian gets it also in fact i'm sure our opponents get it as well that says here's how many people are currently charged with crimes in Oregon that do not have a lawyer. And it's a long list. And there's people on there in Marion County, and there's people on there in Washington County, and there's people on there in Multnomah County. Um, and, and some of them are in custody. And that's, you know, it's a, it's bad enough. I saw one of these guys when I went to court um, out of custody, and, and he literally said, he came up to me and he said, hey, I don't know if I have a lawyer or not. And I asked somebody and I looked and, and I, I found him on the list of people that don't, he just didn't have a lawyer. And he was coming to court and they made him come back a month later and they made him come back a month later. And, you know, he'd been through this several times and still didn't have a lawyer. Um, you know, talk about making it harder to get to work, talk about harder to live your life. Um, but, but that's not even close to as bad as the guys sitting in custody without a lawyer. That's that's the killer. I mean, that's the thing that has to be fixed because that's forcing people into, even if they wanted to take a deal that they shouldn't take, um, they can't because they don't have a lawyer to do it. So, I mean, that's one of the biggest issues that, then that's got to be fixed immediately. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, in February, the Marion County Grand Jury a unanimously found three Salem officers justified uh, in using deadly force against Richard Allen Myers. Two days prior to the deadly incident, Salem police responded uh, to a concerned call reporting Myers uh, appeared uh, suicidal. Uh, what steps uh, should be taken to divert individuals uh, suffering from a mental health crisis uh, from the criminal judicial system uh, to prevent future deadly outcomes. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Todd. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, a thing that exists in Lane County, and it's um, something that's now kind of just starting to get off the ground in Marion County, City of Salem specifically passed. It's called CAHOOTS. Um, it's a non-law enforcement uh, mental health response to you know, I guess what I'll call low level crises, um, you know, the, the kind of good example is if someone's talking to themselves on the street, we don't need a law enforcement officer to respond to that. That's not a public safety issue. That's not a threat to someone. We need a qualified mental health professional and maybe someone with medical background to respond to that situation. Um, and, and that would be a good 
way to kind of alleviate some of also, by the way, some of the burden that the police have because we ask them to do too much. There's as much as there's a staffing issue with public defenders, there's a staffing issue with police as well. And so, uh, you know, uh, cahoots is one such way to make that happen. It requires funding, it requires staffing, it requires a lot of things. Um, Marion County has the budget to do it, but hasn't um, really implemented anything. But the city of Salem, whatever, a week and, a week and change ago, um, city council passed a, a way to basically do requests for proposal and requests for call it qualifications. So, you know, that it is getting up off the ground, at least a pilot program that will try that. It works in Eugene. It works in Springfield. It works in Lane County. Um, you know, so that's one thing. But but that only solves the people you see that um, get contacted by, you know, somebody on the street or 911 or emergency responders or what have you. That doesn't help the people that just are end up in the scenario. And the answer to that question is systemic. It requires um, that we do a better job as a society with the way that we treat uh, people that have mental health issues um, in the way that we um put them in the criminal justice system, even though there are much better alternatives, or or in our case, there aren't better alternatives, and that's why they end up in the criminal justice system. And so, you know, that's that's where the real fix comes in. Um, I had a client, anecdotes are not, not great in these contexts because there's a story for everything, but I represented a guy that had a, a TBI, somebody hit him in, a, in the head with a hammer in 2016, and um, he, he basically just floated around off his meds until he committed a crime that landed him in jail. And then his lawyer, you know, what was there to do? You get him out as quick as you can and then rinse and repeat. And the judge on that case described it as, yeah, he did that until he committed a crime bad enough that now they held him, which is the context that I had him in. Um, but I made it my, I was said, I'm not going to have this guy go to prison. The judge was on board to do anything other than prison. If we could find it, I called up and down, left and right, everybody that it could. And I was literally told that he's in this in-between zone that slips through the cracks of it's not bad enough that he should be sent to the Oregon state hospital, but it's not good enough that he, or, nor less bad that he could be in some unlocked group home. What he needs is a locked group home with med management and sorry, those beds just don't exist. Um, if he had a guardian, maybe if he had, you know, means maybe, but the way it was, it was just nothing to be done. And so that's the real answer is fixing that problem um, is fixing. And by the way, that would have a monumental impact on the impacts of homelessness that we see every day as well, because a lot of the people that are homeless are suffering from these exact same issues. And so really it's a train that we see coming that we know is going to derail at some point that we as a society aren't doing anything about. And so that's not necessarily a DA office policy that fixes that problem, but there's leadership that can be, you know, you can do things, you can advocate for things and you can try things that fix it. Thank you for that. Mr. Decker. Thank you. Um, again, this is a, a very important topic. I do, I'm just realizing that I want to um, acknowledge what our moderator acknowledged at the start of this, which is, we're not running against each other and so it's it's you know we keep agreeing with each other we keep saying the same same things essentially because because we are both looking at this from um from the point of view of needing change and obviously you know different people are, are looking at it from different perspectives but there's a, a lot of agreement between mr todd and i on what are problems with the system as as it exists um and our, our individual counties have their own individual problems. I, I'm not going to disagree with, with what Mr. Todd just said. I just want to focus on a different part of, of the problem because this is a, this is a huge, um, huge problem in scope in the criminal justice system. When we don't address mental illness in the community, when we don't treat it as a public health problem, and get out in front of it, it ends up being a public safety problem. It's not to say that all people who have mental illness end up committing crimes, but a lot of them, you know, people, people who experience mental illness, if, if it's not treated, can get worse. And some portion of people who experience that and get worse do end up hitting a rock bottom that gets them involved in the criminal justice system. And, and when that happens, it's a, it's a tragedy. Um, 
in the, in the sense of a, a bad thing that could have been prevented if people had only acted differently. Right? If we had gotten out in front of, of uh, these problems and treated them as a, as a public health problem, we wouldn't have the public safety problem to deal with. Mental illness is not a, it, it is a big problem and it is not a problem that we are going to be able to arrest our way out of. It is not a problem that we are going to be able to convict our way out of. And yet that's historically what we've been trying to do apparently because we have been under investing in the services that are going to protect us in the community. Uh, treatment services that are easy to access, trauma-informed, culturally competent and based in evidence We've been under investing in them and then pouring more money into the criminal justice system, which is to say, not treating the problem until it ends up in the jail. When you don't treat it in the community, it tends to end up in the jail and then it ends up in the court system. And not only that, but when it ends up in the court system, we're not dealing with it in a smart way. We're letting people with mental illness sit in the jail, which universe, I think probably between in, in each of our counties, it is the largest mental health care provider. Well, no, Marion County has a state hospital. The jail ends up being one of the largest mental health providers in, in any community in America. Um, and it shouldn't be that way. It's a hor it's a, you know, it's by definition a non-therapeutic environment. Um, it is not the kind of care that you would expect to get if you're experiencing serious mental illness. Um, and yet that's where people end up getting treated um, ineffectively and expensively, not for nothing. So we need to, we, we can't just use the jail to house people who are mentally ill. We need to get them out into the community. When the, w Yes, we need a jail to hold people who are so dangerous that they can't be out among the rest of us. But we also need to be treating people, not warehousing them. We need to be getting them into programs that are effective and we need to be doing it earlier on in the process. Here in Washington County, we have something called a mental health court. That's great, but it's probationary. It means it only happens at the end of a case after you plead guilty. We also have something new called a mental health diversion court that also means it only happens at the end of a case after you plead guilty. Um, but in this case, it can, you know, get off your record as opposed to ending up sticking on your record. Also, it's a new thing. It's, they announced it's a great fan, fanfare and it has zero people in it. We need to actually be using the programs that we have to divert people away from incarceration. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, all right, I think we're ready for the next question. So question three, uh, mass shooting and gun violence uh, has become uh, an all too familiar headline. How do you intend to harness the resources of uh, your office to impact gun violence? Uh, we'll start with Mr. Decker. Thank you. Yeah, gun violence is a, is a huge problem in communities across uh, the country. Here in Washington County, gun crime is up 34% in uh, my opponent's term in office. I, when I was a federal prosecutor in the Obama administration, when I was an assistant United States attorney, I built long-term investigations to go after gun traffickers to attack this problem from the supply side because we can't just keep reacting to it in the streets and expect it to somehow solve itself. We need to, we need to prevent um, firearms from getting into the wrong hands in the first place. And, and that doesn't just mean, you know, a stereotype of, of somebody who is the wrong hands to be holding a gun. Often, often what it means is the kinds of people we were just talking about, people who are experiencing mental illness. Um, or if not, if not, strictly speaking, what's called serious mental illness or rising to that level of, of insanity in a court of law, people who are unstable, people who are feeling low, people who are making bad decisions um, should not be anywhere near firearms. Um, we need to be targeting a whole wide swath of responsible solutions that are going to interrupt this problem. Getting, getting firearms away from people who are unstable and making sure that, that our communities are not flooded with them, making sure that they are kept safe and kept in responsible hands. 
And that means more than reacting to gun crime after it happens. Yes, we need to react to gun crime. Yes, we need to hold accountable people who commit violent crimes, but that's not enough because, because real safety means stopping the, the unsafe thing before it happens. We need to get out in front of it. I am very proud to have been, uh, to have, have the support of a group called Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. They have uh, awarded my candidacy the, the distinction of being a gun sense candidate. And what that means is we don't just see this in the old fashioned tough on crime way, that somehow the appearance of toughness is gonna solve this problem. We get out in front. We look for community-based solutions like, like violence interrupters. And we work collaboratively with other government officials, with legislators, with, with mayors, with community-based organizations to get out in front of this problem and stop the gun crime before it happens in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that uh, this is one of those times where it's, I don't need to spend four minutes saying the same thing that Brian just said. Um, I, I guess one of the things I'll add um, is the importance of community policing. I, I think that 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 is one thing that is a, a, a thing that can be done right away that over time will have a perceptible impact on, on gun crime, really on all crime, but on gun crime especially. And you know, the way that I talk about it, you know, when, I, when I'm canvassing, it's one of the things that I talk about is, is uh, mending the relationship between the public and the police. And, you know, the, the DA's office can't control the police procedure. I can't call the chief of police of Salem and say, hey, do more community policing. Uh, I also can't, you know, get him the budget to hire six more officers to do it. Uh, but, but what I can do through my office is be transparent. And I think that that is a really important thing to build the trust back between the public and the police, even though the DA's office isn't either of those things, I think that it's a perfect bridge. And I think doing that, you know, starting up the trust again, recreating that in some way, in the long run, we'll do it. Um, you know, two of the other things that Brian touched on, one being for the, the true, you know, quote unquote bad guys, for the, the gun suppliers or, or similar bad actors who are clearly bad and intentionally bad and intentionally repeatedly bad, you know, we need to hold them accountable. And in that case, what accountability means probably is a prison sentence. And the best way to do that is with solid prosecutions um, that are hard work and good, you know, executed trials that lead to convictions. And, you know, that is one thing that just needs to be done. And it sounds like, oh, yeah, sure. Well, that's what every DA's office does. Well, not all the time. Um, when you when your resources are spread thin as an office, uh, when you have immense office turnover, when you don't have enough uh, deputies to do all of the cases that need to be done, then all of a sudden on the, on the cases that matter, on the scary cases where this guy is a, a true reason why we have increased gun violence in our community, if we're not spending the appropriate amount of time on that case because we're busy either being understaffed or being mismanaged or busy prosecuting other cases that may not be as important to us as a community, we are made less safe for it and the gun violence problem is not being appropriately addressed. So, you know, part of it is absolutely um, the things that um, Brian laid out about um, getting involved with community agencies and doing all that other stuff and really trying to get to it at the source, not from where the guns come from, but at the violence intervention stage. That's absolutely great. But, um, you know, on top of that, community policing and solid prosecutions. All right. Uh, we have a fourth question up. Uh, the presumption of innocence is foundational to our justice system. However, uh, before trial, uh, that presumption is experienced very differently depending on the income or assets of the accused. If unable to pay, even a nonviolent offender uh, could be jailed without being uh, convicted of a uh, crime and uh, at risk of losing employment, uh, employment, and sometimes face home, uh, houselessness. Uh, it is evident that a cash bill disproportionately impacts lower income households uh, and members of the BIPOC community. What steps would you take 
uh, to safely reduce uh, the rate of uh, pre-trial pre uh, incarceration uh, in your county. We'll start with Mr. Todd. Thank you. Yeah, and, and as a brief additional context to Marion County, I, I haven't checked the numbers on the jail recently, uh, but at one point pre-COVID, um, back in the, you know, before times, as it were, about 50% of the Marion County jail, it's 400 plus beds, but let's just call it 400 beds for the sake of ease, 200 or so were held pre-trial and 200 or so, or so were held in a, they were sentenced to a misdemeanor or a probation violation or some sanction. Um, now it's closer to 90% pre-trial, which is uh, awful and um, basically directly reflects what you're talking about. Uh, some of that has, has little to do with bail and a lot more to do with the rate at which sorry, the sounds of South Salem, um, the rate at which we resolve cases in Marion County and really in the system at large. But, but part of it is what you're talking about. And, and there's, two, you know, there's two real answers that I, that I have when we're talking about cash bail or when we're talking about bail at all or pretrial release, pretrial incarceration. One is um, why do we hold people pretrial? Like you said, presumption of innocence exists. It actually, you know, the, the argument I always use in court is it exists even as the jury is deliberating, the person is still presumed innocent even as the 12 of you are having that conversation. Um, the reason we hold people, or the reason we should hold people, this isn't what actually happens, but it should only be if they're a threat to themselves or someone else, or if they're a flight risk. All the other stuff is not a, not a real good reason to hold somebody. Um, and, and I'm sure Brian's seen this a million times. I know I have um, objections to release that will likely cost the person their job um, and, and, and sends us down this path of maybe they weren't high risk before, but now they're going to lose their job. Now they're going to lose their housing. Now all of these bad things are going to happen. Um, and it turns them into high risk because it's a self-inflicted wound that we did upon ourselves as a, as a community for no reason. Um, and so we need to focus to directly answer the question of what's to be done. Um, every release decision needs to be about those two things. Are they a threat to themselves or someone else? Are they a flight risk? Are they going to show up to quarter? Um, you know, we also need a third factor in there of how many beds are we going to use on, on, I mean, it, it does this case rise to the level of someone where if an arsonist or someone that has committed a really bad crime comes in the door, do I want them taking up a bed or do I want the guy that's in front of me right now taking up a bed? And, you know, that's a harder question to answer, obviously, but that's a thing that needs to be taken into account. Um, one thing that Marion County has done relatively recently that is great is a, a kind of pretrial release program where there's a pretrial release officer and a, and a score and kind of a, a tracking while on release without having to post bail. Um, you know, that needs to be expanded and it needs to be leaned on a lot more heavily. I think uh, those are the those are kind of the big talking points that I think about when I talk about pretrial incarceration. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Decker. Thank you. Yeah, again, I think it's important to think about what, what jail is for, what it's, what it's good for, what it's, what it's meant for. And the main thing I, I believe is that jail is there to hold people who are too dangerous to be out among the rest of us. And the problem, as, as Mr. Todd was, uh, was suggesting, is that it is filled with people who don't qualify. Right. There's some people in there who, yes, are, are, are there for the dangerous reason. Um, but instead of paying attention to are you dangerous or are you not dangerous, what, what has happened is we've developed this system of can you pay this amount to get out or can you not? And most people are, are sitting in jail. They haven't had their day in court yet. Um, and they're only, the only reason that they're there is that they can't pay a certain amount to get out. And I, it doesn't make any sense. You know, I think, I think if you are so dangerous that you cannot be out walking amongst the rest of us, then it should not matter that you can post half a million dollars in bail. You shouldn't be able to post half a million dollars and get out. You should be held away from the rest of us. And if you are not so dangerous, um, then it should not matter that you cannot afford to post $100 in bail. You shouldn't be sitting in jail, taking up a jail bed, yes, 
um, but also, you know, the the inhumanity, the inequity, the 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 the, the waste of having a human being in there for for solely that reason doesn't make sense. Um, what Mr. Todd said about uh, about developing this pretrial services program is fantastic. I, I didn't know that about Marion County, but it's it's been the standard in other jurisdictions I've worked in to have something called pretrial services so that the court can rely on making sure that that where where somebody is is not so dangerous that they have to wait in jail, but you know maybe a little bit of a concern about whether they're going to show up to court or not. We can have somebody who works for the court help help keep them on the right track, kind of like a probation officer, somebody that somebody that can check in with them and make sure that they know to show up to court. Um, and it's been very successful in places that I've worked before. Um, it, it costs a fraction of having people sit in jail, and it doesn't interrupt their lives in the same way. They can keep a job, you know, they can afford to to keep their apartment. Their pet doesn't end up going to the to the animal shelter because nobody's there to take care of their pet. Or their parents don't end up suffering because nobody's there to take care of their parents. Um, it's good it's good to keep people in community when you can. What's nonsensical that I've seen out, out of the district attorney's office is is yes arguing for uh, you know bail amounts on cases where we ought to be having people out and and supervised um, or unsupervised. But um, objecting to release on cases where, in the one hand, we're objecting to release, and with the other hand, we are extending a plea offer to get out and go on probation. Which is to say, you can get out, but only if you sign on this line to say that you're guilty and give up your day in court, give, give up your constitutional rights, then we'll let you out. Otherwise, we're saying you're so dangerous that you have to stay in jail. We already know you're not so dangerous because we're willing to offer you this this probation deal, this get out today deal. Um, that's nonsensical, and and people should know it. People should be ashamed of themselves for for suggesting that that that, that makes sense. It's it's unjust. Um, and again, we need to be focusing on what is going to keep our communities safe, and what is just. What is justice for the people involved? What is justice for the accused and their families? What is justice for the victims? Um, and, and what is the right thing to do? That kind of playing games is, is exactly the opposite. Awesome, thank you. Uh, all right, our, uh, our fifth question is, the mandatory minimum prison sentences uh, required uh, by Measure 11 uh, have had severe consequences uh, for the African-American uh, communities as well as the Native American. Uh, Native American communities. Prosecutors' uh, use of uh, the law has skyrocketed the number of people in, in prison in Oregon. Uh, what, are you, uh, what are your views on Measure 11 uh, and its impacts? Uh, we'll start with Mr. Decker. Yeah, I, I want to first acknowledge that the crimes that are categorized under Measure 11 are our most serious crimes. And that when you think of people committing those crimes, um, you think of really bad things that, that people have done, the worst things that people do to one another. Um, those, those tend to be the crimes where people are so dangerous, they, they end up getting a prison sentence and they get held apart from the rest of us for a time. And that's part of what it means to hold them accountable for those sorts of crimes. When the community thinks of these crimes under Measure 11, you think of those archetype crimes. When legislators pass laws related to these crimes, they think of the archetype of like a, a robbery in the second degree, um, you know, two, pe two people sticking up a, a, you know, a convenience store or something like that. Um, but when prosecutors make the decision about what they're going to charge, and what pleas they're going to offer and what sentences to recommend. They don't think about that core crime that fits into robbery in the second degree. They think about the least culpable one. They think about the minimal one, which is why it's called mandatory minimum. That's the least sentence you can get. And so, and so prosecutors will make a decision to, to fit a particular fact pattern into this, this very high crime 
that then triggers a mandatory minimum sentence, even though it's not what people think of when they think of robbery in the second degree. The things I've seen charged as robbery in the second degree in Washington County, more than once I've seen, I swear to God, two 18-year-olds after school jump a classmate on the sidewalk, um, punch him, take his backpack and run off. And that's charged as robbery in the second degree. Technically, you can fit that fact pattern into the elements of, of robbery in the second degree. But the mandatory minimum sentence of six years, nobody thinks that an 18-year-old who's never been in trouble with the law before needs to go to prison for six years on that fact pattern. Not even the prosecutor who is charging robbery in the second degree thinks that some 18-year-old who's never been in trouble before needs to go to prison for six years based on those facts. Um, but they charge it anyway because if they have that holding, holding that, that penalty over this person's head, they can extract whatever plea deal they, they want from this person. They can get them to give up their day in court because there's no way anybody would go to trial and risk that, that kind of penalty. That's the true meaning of mandatory minimum sentences. That's the problem with it. That's why it needs serious reform. Also, while we have them, we need to be charging crimes in a sane and sensible and just way, not, not, not trying to fit things into boxes that will maximally apply pressure to people to get them to plead guilty. We need to make sure that the, that the crimes that we're charging and the sentences that we're seeking are just and will result in just outcomes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tom. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I think really one of the problems with with ballot measure eleven. I guess let me say this as a caveat. So the law needs to be better for for some of the reasons that Brian just set forth, and some of the reasons that I'm about to tell you. But the flip side is, as DAs, and I'm I'm sure Brian agrees with this, um, although he doesn't get a chance to rebut. So if he doesn't, too bad. But um, it, you know, we're still obligated to follow the law, and so even if it's something that we don't necessarily agree with um, when charges fit into the ballot measure 11 definition in the archetypal way that he was describing, um, it's as long as it's the law of the land, the thing that, that we as DAs will have to do. Um, that being said, the, the reason the law needs to be better is, is multifaceted. Um, it, beyond the 18 year old that gets jumped that shouldn't go to prison and definitely shouldn't go to prison for 60 months, which is a perfect example of, of why the one size fits all is problematic. Um, it's expensive. Um, when, when you hear the words mandatory minimum, what a lot of people don't realize is that is including what might otherwise be available to them at the Department of Corrections. So a, a 60 month sentence versus a 60 month mandatory minimum sentence are not created equal. The mandatory minimum sentence doesn't come with treatment. It doesn't come with the eligibility to earn early release or other things of that nature. Um, it basically doesn't incentivize anything other than, you know, exist for 60 months. Whereas a regular prison sentence has built in incentives and has built in motivations for people that are incarcerated. Um, you know, the other thing that it really takes away is judicial discretion. So beyond, beyond what we're talking about with the DA's charging decision and or whether something fits, can technically fit the statute, um, when you take away the judge's discretion to make a de decision, you are altering the fundamental nature of the criminal justice process. Um, and I will give you a very good example of this. Right now, um, Brian and I are both defense attorneys. Our constitutional obligation as defense attorneys is to our client to get them an acquittal or the best result or to to do represent their interests right the prosecutor has a completely different constitutional obligation the prosecutors is really twofold it's they're responsible for the public safety of everyone in the community and they're responsible for the protection of the rights of every single individual in the community and and so the the result that a prosecutor will reach on what sentence should be sought or what charge should be brought um, that that decision is a totally different one than what the judge's constitutional obligation is, which is to be fair and impartial and hand down a sentence that they believe to be fair and impartial. And so you as a prosecutor might think and, and have a conversation with the victim and decide, you know what, I believe and, and the victim believes we both believe that this this individual should do 70 months in, in the Department of Corrections to hold them to hold the, the individual accountable for their conduct. We're going to ask for 70 months. 
Well, if it's ballot measure 11, that is the end of the road. That is the end of the discussion. If it isn't a day for day sentence, if it isn't a mandatory minimum, then the judge has discretion to do something else. And, and the other thing that isn't often brought up in these discussions is we're not talking about 70 months versus the person walks free. Um, in most situations with ballot measure 11, if ballot measure 11 didn't exist, if you just magically wipe the law off the books, uh, most sentences would still be prison sentences. Um, and for the flip side, for the scary cases where we want more than the mandatory minimum, uh, most judges would have the authority to send people for more than the mandatory minimum. So it basically takes away options without creating any value for us. All right, thank you both. Uh, the next question is, uh, according to the American Bar Association's uh, 2021 National uh, Population Survey, uh, the African Americans only account for uh, five percent of U.S. attorneys. What are your plans to recruit more Black, Native, uh, and other lawyers of color uh, to your county district's uh, office if elected? Uh, we will start with uh, Mr. Tom. Yeah, I've I've talked about this before. You know, one one kind of low hanging fruit option is seeking um, employees outside of the regular uh, sphere of where you hire people from, which in Oregon is basically Lewis and Clark, Willamette, and U of O. Um, you know, there are law schools in Washington and California. We get some people obviously coming in, but but employment searches are typically you you make the job posting, and it's likely students and or new lawyers coming from those three schools that apply. Um, and you get, you know, the, the cut of, of that, you know, breakdown from those diverse life experiences or lack thereof. And so one of the easiest things is to look outside that range, um, go elsewhere, go to some other school on the East coast or in the middle of the country and, and try and get people to come in, come here and work. Um, that's one. Another thing that's that's kind of being done for us a little bit is the bar, the Oregon bar is considering alternatives to just simply going to law school and taking the bar. Um, you know, the bar process itself it kind of gatekeeps people that don't have resources. Um, you know, when I took the bar exam, the fee for the test and the application to the Oregon State Bar itself, regardless of the test, is a couple hundred bucks, which isn't cheap. But if you really want to do the test the right way, you got to stay at the hotel the night before and the night during the test so that you're well rested and you can't be late. You don't have all that stress. So it's a couple of nights in a hotel. It's the meals that come with it. It's all the costs associated with that. And by the way, for the two months before you take the test, it's a $3,000 class and four or five hours of your life every day um, just to make sure that you pass the thing. Um, and so, it, you know, it's, it's really when you add that onto the costs of law school and the entire process, what it takes to get to be a lawyer is, you know, it's kind of a financial burden. It's a hard thing for people to do. And so Oregon is now considering alternatives to that process. Um, we we kind of tested it a little bit with the COVID uh, there was one section that didn't have to take the bar and was able to qualify, but now they're talking about doing other things, which I think will help with this issue um, in terms of access to um, to being a lawyer without necessarily having to go through that process. If you have experience as a paralegal or experience in a similar field or mentorship from a lawyer. And so, you know, I think that's going to do a lot of good. Um, and then third would just be being aware that it's an issue and, and trying to find good candidates to do the good work and, and get people with diverse life experiences in the door any way you can. Stecker. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm I'm not my first choice to run for this position. I I I knew that somebody had to take on this problematic DA that we have here in Washington County, and I went out and tried to tried to recruit for somebody to run for this office, um, whether it is a, a lawyer of color, a woman, somebody with lived experience of the criminal justice system. That's who I saw myself working behind the scenes for and enthusiastically voting for. Um, and it was incredibly difficult to try to recruit for, for this position, um, which is not an excuse, it's a, it's a problem. 
I am uh, I am a, I am a 40 year old just straight white guy with a beard, and there's an awful lot of elected leaders in uh, the Portland metro area who look like me, and it's a problem. And it means that if if I am afforded this responsibility, part of my responsibility is to recruit and mentor and foster that that bench of qualified candidates to take over um, this position and this profession in, in the coming years. I, when I look at our current Washington County District Attorney's Office, I know that they, 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 have, um, they have a diverse group of people working there, they do. Um, the problem is that at the very top of the office, the people who actually make the most important decisions that guide the office, the people who have to sign off on the most important cases, the, the senior level deputy district attorneys and the, and the chief deputy district attorneys, that, that group of people that, that my opponent Kevin Barton has elevated to the very top of the office, there are more white guys named Jeff than there are lawyers of color. Literal fact. We, we need to be able to um, recruit people into the office by showing them that it is an environment where they are welcome, that it is not an environment where, you know, white supremacy, whether actively or passively, reigns, where, um, where this, is, this is a place where we have diverse voices, diverse in life experience. Um, and we need to do that because it's good for everyone. It, like the evidence shows that having people who disagree, having people who have diverse experience and diverse perspectives leads to better decisions when they come together and collaborate. It, it, will, it will help everyone to, to make sure that we're elevating voices uh, from, from diverse life experiences and diverse backgrounds. It will also make for a better criminal justice system. It will, it will combat this tunnel vision that has led us to where we are. It will, it will make sure that, that within the office, the people who are making decisions about what's gonna happen in criminal cases aren't stuck in a, in a paradigm about what it means to be pulled over by the police and how you react to that and how one type of reaction might look guilty and one type of reaction might look innocent, that they are not stuck in their own paradigm from their own very narrow life experience to think, to think what it means. We need to have other voices in the room. We need to have people elevated who are, who are making decisions. And so being very intentional about that, not being, you know, colorblind is, 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 is you know, it is making us not pay attention to the problem. We need to be aware of the problem and be intentional about the decisions that we're making in the workplace so that we can make the workplace more diverse in perspectives and better, better functioning, making better decisions. Uh, thank you both for your, for your answers. Um, this next question is uh, along similar lines. Uh, describe a time uh, when injustice impacted you or a loved one, uh, two-parter, uh, and if elected, uh, how will you use your privilege as a white man uh, in a powerful position uh, to partner with communities of color. Let's we'll start with uh, Mr. Decker. I, um, I, I've been a white man my entire life, but um, I, uh, I grew up um, the only child of a single mom. I grew up in a working class neighborhood. Um, the, I went to public schools, majority Latino public schools in a majority Latino district. It was underfunded. Um, and a lot of my friends uh, were treated differently than I was, um, were, uh, you know, profiled when we'd go into a grocery store together or, or you know, get the side eye in a way that um, I only experienced by proxy, right? It wasn't me at the at the target of, of it. It was, it was me experiencing it through my friends and, and loved ones. I have, over the course of my career, uh, representing victims, representing the accused, representing the concept of justice as a, as a prosecutor, 
one of the key skills I have developed, and it is a skill, is compassion, is empathy. It is it is a, a, a strength and a skill that you have to develop through practice. It is you know paying attention to people who have a different experience than you, and putting yourself in their shoes. Um, and I think I think that 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 is something that you know I I can't separate from from who I am. That sense of compassion and and empathy. That's just a core personality wise that's a core value of, of of mine and that's why i've i've run this campaign in this way that's why i before it was a campaign i was doing outreach into the community and talking to folks who would tell me this is so interesting to be talking to somebody who's thinking about running for district attorney because people who who are the district attorney's office never come and talk to us um i am very very proud to have the support of of uh, community groups um, and individuals, community leaders, who uh, you know do not do not often get get thought of by legacy prosecutors as as people who have a stake in the criminal justice system. Um, I'm proud to have the endorsement of Latino Network. I'm proud to have the endorsement of Apano, the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon. I'm proud to have the endorsement of Imagine Black um, and Washington County Ignite. Um, groups. Uh, next up, I'm I'm going to insult somebody by leaving somebody off here. Um, it feels like the Oscars for some reason. Um, but the the point is, I've I've spoken to so many people who have a stake in what we're doing, and who and who deserve to have a voice and who deserve to have a seat at the table. Um, and the reason, part of the reason I've run my campaign that way in order to be informed about what the community needs is, is because through that practice, through developing those skills, that's how I'm going to learn to be a better leader and run the office that way. Make sure that we have that community outreach and are talking to people who really have a stake in the system, in the community, in the decision-making process as district attorney, as the leader, in the in the local criminal justice system, so I, I have I have built those relationships. I cherish those relationships, and I will foster them and maintain them because they're going to keep me honest as as district attorney. They're going to help me be a better leader and make better decisions. Um, and and I am just immensely humbled and thankful to have that support. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tom. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting question. I, you know, I'm glad I had the four minutes to think about it while while Brian went. I, you know, I don't know that I personally or a loved one has ever been unfairly impacted. I, I, I mean, it, you know, talk about your privilege, right? I, my parents are both lawyers. I went K through JD, and you know, all of the injustices that come to mind in my brain right now are suffered by a client that I've represented. Uh, the closest I can get is probably the most important client that I've ever ever represented, and and what happened in her case, I I couldn't possibly give uh, give the facts justice in three minutes. I talk about it all the time, so if you you know if you look it up anywhere else, you'll see it. But um, you know the the bigger the bigger question, and maybe the bigger answer is how will you use your privilege? And and I'm doing so um, by sitting before you today and by running for office. Um, I have, you know, this isn't what I set out to do in my life. I didn't plan on being a politician. I didn't plan on fundraising and knocking on doors and talking to candidate forums. Um, I had a great life before this where I, yeah, I was a public defender and I represented people that couldn't afford to represent themselves, but also it was cush. It was, yeah, it's hard work, but also at the same time, how hard is it to go to court and make an argument? And whether your client goes to jail at the end of the day or not, you go home and you can afford everything and you know you just live your life and and i really got to this point because i felt that if i can do something i feel the obligation to do something and so it's a little cliche to say that and it's a little cliche to say that i'm using my white privilege to run for office i mean that's a you know that's probably white privilege in and of itself just saying that but um 
but that's the truth. I, I mean, that's, that's why I'm here and that's why I'm doing this. And, and that's why I don't, I don't carry with me into this, the, the desire for power or the desire for influence or the desire to advance my station in life. I'm not, I'm not running to be some sort of political springboard. I'm never going to do another minute of call time as long as I live after May 17th. Um, you know, the only doors I'll knock on after that aren't going to be for me, be for other people. I, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's an incredibly difficult question to answer because I'm, I feel some combination of shame that I don't have a good personal story to tell and, and maybe not, not shame that I'm saying, you know, it's, it sounds like I'm bragging when I say I'm doing this, um, out of privilege, but, you know. I mean, I'm doing it because I can, and somebody's got to step up and do the right thing. And, and I, I mean, I, I mean, like Brian said, I, I asked other people to run before, before I did, I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't say, yes, this has been in motion. This has been in the works for forever. I mean, this was a kind of slapdash thing at the last second. Um, you know, when you decide to do it, you decide to do it. So that's, that's all I got. Thank you. And I guess to, to be clear, you know, there's, there's no need for, uh, for you to feel ashamed. Um, you know, I, I think we would love someone who understands, right, at the end of the day, who understands the needs of our communities and, and uh, wants to fight alongside us for, for, for true justice. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad nothing, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, things haven't impacted you or a loved one um, at the same time. You know, uh, a lot of our communities will continue to uh, to battle. You know, the the true uh, what is true justice for us, um, uh, and as we continue to adjust uh, the laws the uh, laws of the land that um, you know imprison a lot of uh, a lot of our communities. So, uh, thank you again for your answers, though, um, and for uh, you know being vulnerable and being willing to share with us. Uh, with that being said. Uh, uh, you all are uh, doing so great on time that you qualify for a bonus question. So we will continue on to uh, question number eight. Uh, uh, the eighth question is um, the, uh, the right to be tried before a jury of peers uh, is, longstanding, is a longstanding benchmark uh, of the American judicial system. Uh, however, uh, race-based discrimination in uh, jury uh, selection persists today. Uh, which uh, equitable measures uh, would you put in place uh, when selecting jurors? Uh, we'll start with Mr. Top. Well, this this stems into another um, kind of prosecutorial approach where I differ from my opponent. Um, I take very seriously when I talked about the two constitutional obligations that the DA has, the public safety of every person and the protection of the rights of every person. Um, nowhere in that description does it go do something that's not above board to the utmost degree and focus on getting a conviction beyond everything else. Um, there's a, there's a case from like the 1920s that says it is the duty of the state to ensure that the defendant has a fair trial. And so, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where the fairness of the process is part of what the DA's job is. And some people might not like to hear that. Some people might not like to hear uh, a district attorney candidate who is a defense attorney right now saying that's that's the obligation. But that's not coming from a place of I'm a defense attorney and I want some I want some better deal or make it harder to convict. No, no, no. It's it's the constitutional right that protects all of us. And and that absolutely extends to to jury selection and to you know, really the flip side of what jury selection is and what you're really getting at, which is the ability to get rid of a juror for no cause whatsoever. So in jury selection, you, um, in a 12 person jury in a felony case, you have at least in Marion County, six jurors that you can get rid of for no reason whatsoever. I don't like the way they answered a question. I don't like that they like video games. I don't like that they don't like video games. You can, you can boot somebody for any reason you want six times. Um, you can boot somebody an unlimited number of times if there is a reason, like they can't show up to court the second day or they know you or the defendant or someone in the, in the trial. But, but when we're talking about how do you use those six challenges that aren't, um, that aren't for cause, 
um, you, you just simply can't use them unless you have a darn good reason. And, and that reason can't be, I think this juror might hose us on a trial, um, or I think that this juror isn't as favorable as some other juror. I, the, the question you have to ask yourself as a prosecutor is, if this juror stays on the jury, is this trial going to be a fair trial? And, and so, you know, I don't know that that directly addresses it. I've never, I've never had um, what it's called as a Batson challenge. Um, I've never had to do that. I've never seen um, a Marion County DA do that um, in a jury trial. You know, I've obviously never gotten rid of a juror um, on a no cause based on race or anything like that. I, I mean, the only time I've gotten rid of jurors is if I either think that they're in too much of a hurry or I didn't like an answer that, that they gave. Those are kind of my two guideposts for, you know, getting rid of somebody. I, I, I never, there's even a person that I like disagreed with about, I can't remember what it was. It was, I, it was the new Star Wars movie or something. He liked it and I didn't. And I joked with my client, like we should get rid of this guy, but I didn't do it. But I haven't seen it happen, but I know that it does happen. Um, it's a thing you got to be aware of. And, and it is a, it is a, a thing that can jeopardize the fairness of the process and, and something that you got to be, you know, on the lookout for. Thank you. Mr. Decker. I, I really appreciate Mr. Todd going first on this one because he got to explain what, what the jury selection process is, is all about and, and how it works. And all I get to do is, is hammer my opponent. Kevin Barton, who is the current uh, district attorney in, in Washington County, because this is something that, that he uniquely has messed up in a, in a, in a horrible, uh, nonsensical way. Um, that the Batson challenge that, that Mr. Todd was, was just talking about, um, it, is, it is pretty rare for it to come up in trial court. It is even more rare for it to be the reason that it decides a case in the court of appeals and to be to have a case reversed because a jury was picked in a racially motivated way. You know, all of you can you can you can strike a juror for any reason under the sun because he because he looked at me weird or whatever. You can't do it because of race. And that's what Kevin Barton did. That's what, that's what my opponent, the currently elected district attorney of Washington County did. He, he got shot down by our court of appeals in Oregon because he removed a black man from a jury um, and did it for no reason other than he was a black man. The excuse he gave was that he was an unemployed student and he didn't like unemployed students on his jury with I, I tend to agree with Mr. Todd. What is what on earth is a prosecutor of all lawyers doing, picking winners and losers, and deciding that an unemployed student isn't a isn't a good juror? Um, but set that aside. He left the two white unemployed students on the jury, which is why the court of appeals saw through him. Um, and that's prosecutorial misconduct. Most cases, if they get reversed at the Court of Appeals, um, it's because some evidence came in that was unconstitutional. It's because um, they used uh, an unconstitutionally coerced uh, interrogation uh, statements of the defendant. It's because they, they seized evidence in violation of the Fourth Amendment. Um, and Washington County District Attorney's Office gets lots of cases reversed at the Court of Appeals for those reasons more than any other county in the state, it's not even close. But it's, it's pretty rare to get a case reversed for prosecutorial misconduct, where it's the DA actually did or said something in the courtroom that they're not allowed to do. Um, and, it, and it happened to our elected district attorney in, in Washington County, Kevin Barton. And it's not only that, but the Court of Appeals called him out um, because the way he reacted to the challenge to the defense attorney saying, hey, hold on, there's, a, there's something fishy about you removing this black man from the jury. The way he reacted to it was throwing a temper tantrum in the courtroom and, and calling the defense attorney racist for saying that a black man deserved to be on the jury. And the Court of Appeals extensively quoted him. They don't do this all the time, folks. They don't call out trial lawyers in, in, in appellate opinions all the time. They, they, they quoted him in a, a full paragraph of this tirade that he went on in the courtroom. And what the Court of Appeals said 
was if Batson, if this if this court case that protects our rights to have juries that that uphold principles of equal protection, if if that is ever going to fulfill its promise as something that protects our constitutional rights, we cannot allow court to devolve into this. We cannot allow court to devolve into Kevin Barton's temper tantrum, this unprofessional tirade that he went on in the courtroom when he was challenged. It is, um, by my count, the year of our Lord, 2022. And we are in Washington County, Oregon. Um, and I don't even know why we're having this discussion about, about how we can have an elected official who has done something like this, honestly. Um, we don't do that. We don't do things that way. We, we certainly couldn't have leaders who do things that way. That's what I got for you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Uh, at this point, we're at the candidate's closing statements. So each candidate will have uh, two minutes to provide a closing statement. Uh, Mr. Decker, we'll start with you, and then we'll go with uh, Mr. Tom. Yeah, I think I think I thought Mr. Todd was going to go first again, but that's okay. I can go. Um, I just want to thank you for for having this uh, this forum. Um, this is these questions were fantastic. We got to really talk about these these issues. I wish it had been a little more contentious than it was, which is not to say I wish that Mr. Todd disagreed with me. I just wish that my opponent had accepted the invitation to be here, and I don't know why I didn't. Um, but I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to answer all of these questions. And, and I, and I thank you all for being here and for, and for paying attention to this, paying attention to a, a district attorney election, because it is a very important election. It, this, this position of district attorney, um, has a, has a tremendous impact on the criminal justice system in, in our homes and all of the issues that are related to the criminal justice system. It has an impact on addiction. It has an impact on homelessness. It has an impact on mental illness. It has an impact on racial justice. It has an impact on workers' rights. It has an impact on, on reproductive rights. Because so much of our society has been dominated by the criminal justice system, and we have counted on it to solve so many problems for so long. And if we're going to get serious about tackling those problems, then we've got to get serious about this position of district attorney. We've got to, we've, we've got to see it as a collaborative position that can, that can work with others, that can work with elected officials across the county, that can work with legislators, that can work with community organizations like the ones I mentioned. Um, and that's what I intend to do as your next district attorney in, in Washington County. Don't forget to vote. May 17th, ballots come out next week, so get them in early. Um, it, is, it is deeply, deeply important. Thank you for paying attention to it. Thank you, Mr. Tom. Thanks, I, uh, you know, po politicians make promises and fail to live up to those promises all the time. I'm aware that by participating in this discussion, I seem like a politician. That really isn't who I am. That's really not why I'm here. I've seen firsthand what the system has become, and I've seen the need that we have for change. So I'm gonna make you a promise I can keep. When I am elected, I will not make a single decision in my entire four years in office with the thought of reelection. I will instead do the right thing every single day. I will hold criminals accountable, but I will also hold myself accountable as a public official. I won't make excuses. I won't write op-eds that blame anyone and everyone else. I won't lie to get elected. I will treat the position as truly nonpartisan. You may agree with me or you may disagree with me, but I will be responsible for your public safety all the same. I won't use fear tactics or misrepresent facts. I won't be soft on crime. I will be tough on injustice. I wanna to do the job the way it was meant to be done. 
Lobbying for the Oregon District Attorneys Association is a job for a lobbyist. The Marion County District Attorney needs to focus on making Marion County safe. I want to take cases. I want to show up in court and I want to do the work that isn't glamorous. Doing the work yourself is good leadership and it will lead to better and harder work from everyone in the office. That's especially true when you treat everyone with respect regardless of their role in the office. And we can always do better. Once I write the ship, reduce caseloads, and make us safer than we are right now, I'm not going to stop. For the entire four years I'm in office, I will keep asking the question, what can we do better? To start with, I want to give crime victims real input and real support. I want to ensure that we treat everyone fairly and equally. And I want to mend the relationship between the public and the police. I'm Spencer Todd and I'm running for DA in Marion County because I believe that these things will make us safer as a community. Thank you. All right, um, so now we're uh, heading to our close. Uh, first off, a special thanks to our audience members uh, who submitted questions and our partners at uh, Open Signal who are airing uh, this Urban League Forum. Uh, and again, we thank uh, the community partners who support this event. Uh, now, uh, candidates uh, Decker and Todd, uh, thank you for participating today. Um, I uh, truly wish you uh, the best uh, on your campaign trails uh, as you, uh, you know, continue to battle it out in these last few weeks. Uh, for the audience, uh, please remember that the Urban League is a nonprofit organization that relies upon donations uh, to be able to serve the community. Learn more about our fantastic programs and powerful advocacy by visiting uh, our website at, at ulpdx.org. Uh, if you're able, uh, I invite you to make a donation as well. On behalf of the Urban League, uh, President Nikenge Harmon Johnson, the Board of Directors, and all of our members, I thank our audience for participating today. If you uh, are not a member of the Urban League, I welcome you to join or renew your annual mem uh, membership. Uh, visit the website again, it is uh, uh, ulpdx.org uh, to join the movement for justice and, uh, and equity in Oregon. Also, if you need assistance uh, voting during the primary or registering uh, during uh, the general, uh, staff at Urban League are ready to talk to you. Uh, you can reach out uh, via our website, social media, or call 503 280-2600 for assistance. Uh, again, my name is Lamar Wise, and it's been a pleasure to be your moderator today. Thank you.